Hey everyone, thank you for joining us online here at Destiny. If you haven't had a chance to visit our campus, we would love for you to come out and join us for our 1030 service. But if you can't, you can always watch us online at destinyokc.com. And while you're there, you can watch any of our past messages, see any of our upcoming events, or read pastor's vlogs. Also, don't forget to follow us on all of our social media platforms right here. And now, here's this week's message. Well, today we're going to be reading the Bible. Shocker. Do you just love God's Word? I'm just growing in a deeper adoration and appreciation for the richness of His Word. And I just realized in my times of uh, neglect and times past when I wasn't really diving in, I hadn't really created a, a rhythm you know the turn the page rhythm has been a great rhythm for me as a part of my read and study um, but the more I grow in the reality of God's Word the more I just am so deeply appreciative of this treasure that we have yeah. so uh, you can it's gonna be just a little bit of groundwork before we get there but just so you're aware because I am encouraging you bring your Bibles um, to service but we're gonna go start in Luke chapter 4 when we get to uh, the reading of scripture today I do just want to say um, probably I don't know three years ago the Lord just began to stir um, for us to understand and explore the revelation of the table and what that really means so when you walked in you might have seen the round table back there with the come to the table graphic on it um, <clears throat> but that's been a focus of ours I think we've got that graphic we can pop up um, that's been a focus of ours quite a, quite a lot, just to really explore what the table of the Lord is all about. It's the place where we discover a deeper friendship with God and a deeper friendship with each other. And so today we want to explore the table just a bit. The plan was to actually have tables set up across this room. And uh, we were all going to sit at tables and have lunch together today. But then we kind of calculated the numbers and realized that's just not possible because uh, too many of you have invited your friends and family here, and so you messed that plan up, <clears throat> which is wonderful. Uh, but in light of that, what we're going to do is um, it just doesn't have to be fancy for us to explore the revelation of the table. It's about relationship. And so we're going to invite you. We've actually got little blankets. If the kids, when they come over, if they want to make little picnic stations, and, and uh, you can get those uh, we'll give you some details on all this, but we can get the blankets back, wash them, get them uh, for the next time we would use them. You can circle up chairs. You can do whatever you'd like to do. But we have pizza for everyone that is going to be showing up, um, which is a whole lot of pizza today. Uh, well, I'm sorry. I I'm so sorry. It is Italian cuisine. And it is from Domino's. Domino's Italian cuisine. Um, and so we've got that for everyone. Plan to stick around and, uh, and, and enjoy just some relational time connecting with each other and um, circle chairs, whatever you'd like to do. Uh, it'll be wonderful. And I know some people didn't show up prepared to um, pay for lunch. And so that's why we just wanted to provide that for everyone. And let me encourage you, if you're able to do so, just give. Just make a donation. We're talking about what it is to be generous in our way of life. And so here, we don't pass buckets, but you can find your way onto our um, online. You can give through the giving stations, or you can scan that QR code. Um, and, and let's just be generous, everybody, and we'll have bases covered on all of that. I, I thought about this, and this is important in regard to our giving. I heard the UN produced research years ago, the number one killer in the world is contaminated water. And the UN produced a, a research that said we could actually solve the world's problem for a mere $10 billion, which sounds overwhelming, doesn't it? Like $10 billion. But how many of you would love to see the number one killer in the world eradicated from the planet? I mean, it would be beautiful. Like third world countries, and we don't understand this, but the number one killer of humanity is contaminated water for just $10 billion. And then it uh, seemed overwhelming until I realized if North America tithed, in one year we would have $143 billion. And I just thought, 
the world's problems seem really big until they are brought into comparison with the obedient church. And it's not just the, the illustration I'm giving, but how many know overall the world's problems seem so overwhelming until we bring them next to the obedient church. And when the church begins to walk in obedience, society begins to be transformed. So I would encourage you uh, just exploring and again just pop that up if you would one more time grab that qr code if you want we don't do a lot of focus on giving here and so uh, whenever i mention it, i want to make sure we understand where we're going with it our heart is just to see god's kingdom expand we're very cautious in our approach to all of that and um, so i would encourage you uh, let's be faithful in our tithe and let's see transform society all around the world amen it's a beautiful beautiful reality to to look at that <clears throat> um so here we are in 2024, and as we're journeying through this year, we're learning what it is to be awake and engaged, spiritually awake and truly engaged, as we're just serving the heart of God and exploring what it means to walk with Him. Uh, it's more than just what we believe, but it involves how we behave. How many of you know that's true? Raise your hand if you find it easier to believe than you do to behave. Can I just see? <clears throat> so what we're trying to do is not just talk about what we believe, but actually introduce people as a family to how we behave. So here are the principles in great capsulized form. We've been saying it these first few weeks of the year. So uh, declare it with me if you would, and let's say it out loud together. We are outrageously loving people who passionately pursue the Lord with irrationally giving lifestyles as we consistently submit to God's desires and effectively disciple others to do the same. Boy, that fourth phrase is hot today, isn't it? Consistently submit to God's desires. What a beautiful statement. And that's what we're going to focus on today as we step into this um, particular emphasis but we need to understand that's a great declaration of who God's designed and desires us to be it starts with love should always start with love when when God's in the mix God is love it always want, we wanted to start there but here's the thing that I just want to reiterate and it's something we're just now learning quite honestly we're on this journey together um, but this is not about trying to be more like that because a lot of times we find ourselves trying not being able to do it, and then getting frustrated. How many of you have ever tried to do something and you couldn't do it, so you got frustrated, and somewhere along the way, you just kind of lessen your pursuit of trying? And so what we want to do is not necessarily focus on trying, but we want to focus on training. And when you start to get a different picture of what we're desiring to accomplish and how we're working at that, everybody's at different stages, everybody's at different places. And so we want to not just try, we want to train. So the principles, here are the principles that we see uh, of those five emphasis, the, the outrageously loving, passionately pursuing, irrationally giving, consistently submitting, effectively discipling. Um, don't just try to do those, but train to be those. And here are the practices, not just core values, but then the core practices. So first, outrageously loving, we're learning what it is to Sabbath. <laughs> and service is about anonymous service to others. Just great practice. This week, find a place of Sabbath, rest in the Lord, and anonymously serve somebody. It's a beautiful reality. It's just a great way to train to be more outrageously loving. You get the picture, fasting and scripture, getting in the word, fasting, missing a meal on purpose. Um, not today for lunch, by the way. But... Just going deeper in your pursuits. Simplicity and generosity. Did anybody clean out your closet this past week? Raise your hands if you cleaned out your closet. I actually got some hate mail from some people cleaning out their closet because they didn't want to get rid of stuff. And they said, I'm doing this because of you. Thank you for your obedience, your joyful obedience, okay? Simplicity, generosity. When we simplify our lives, it empowers us to generously give to others. And today, solitude and community, it's an interesting pairing of these two, and I'm very excited about what this looks like. Here's the thing, as we, I won't go into all the rest of it, but practices reveal our priorities. I want you to think about what the practices are in your life, because when I look at your practices, I clearly see your priorities. How many of you want your children to have your values? Of course we do. We want them to have our values. 
But the thing you have to understand is children don't carry our values just because we tell them that's what we believe. Children actually carry our true values because they see the way we behave. And that's why our practices are so vitally important in what this all looks like. So a meal together today. Uh, please don't just rush out. If you're able to stay, please stick around. Uh, we've got plenty of pizza for everybody. This is a value to us. And we're going to start to figure out how to do this more effectively and how to mobilize people to do this more effectively. Inviting people into your home, around your table, or to a meal or a coffee or something along those lines. Just deepening the value of the relationship. That's an important part. Um, I've actually heard from five different pastors, two of them that are going to be driving three hours to be here next week at our uh, worship night, and we're going to gather uh, one week from tonight and worship in this place with churches from all over the state of Oklahoma. It's really going to be powerful, and I, I want you to understand it's a value. It's a practice, gathering together in worship, not just our church, but we believe in the unity of the body of Christ. So these, fa these church families that we're in relationship with uh, have been praying all over the state of Oklahoma, and now they're converging to central o the state of Oklahoma, right here in Oklahoma City, and we get to be that site to host that. So come and let's go deeper. Uh, March 1st and 2nd is Fuel the Fire. Value. We want to gather together in a place of just exploring and pursuing the Lord. We need you to register for this event. If you've not done so, please do that. You can use your phone right now and register. But this is March 1st and 2nd. We'll be meeting. I had somebody ask this week, will we be doing prayer during the day? Yes. We'll be joining here Friday morning at 9 a.m. with leaders and church family, anybody who's wanting to come and just press in and pray. And then Friday evening, Steve Upple with us from England, Saturday morning, 9 to 1, a full morning of exploring practices that really release something of God's kingdom in our hearts. This is really cool. Last year, we provided child care so that all the adults could come in and really be filled up. And we sat in a staff meeting this week, and Tabitha, uh, Pastor Tabitha in the kids' ministry for the older kids, she said, something unusual happened last year when we had Fuel the Fire. She said, the Sunday after Fuel the Fire, the week after, our kids came in with a desire and a passion to worship that was from a deeper place than we had known. She said there were two kids on two sides of the room, and both of them had a vision, like God opened their eyes to see something spiritually. They didn't talk to each other. They talked to an adult, and they shared the exact same vision that they saw in kids' ministry. That is profound. How many of you know God is able to wake up our kids in powerful and profound ways? We're believing for that. Man, I want my kids to walk with God like that. And so what happened was the fire got fueled in your hearts. You carried it to your homes, and it woke up something in your kids. So you know what we've decided to do this year? We're not just providing child care. We're going to do fuel the fire for kids we're bringing in ministers to minister to our kids. They're going to be having fuel the fire for kids while we're having fuel the fire for adults. Come on, we're really believing God for the fire of the Spirit of God. Come on, let's do. Let's just praise that in and declare it right now, in the might of in the mighty name of Jesus. Awaken our hearts, God. Awaken our sons and our daughters to know the Lord their God. They will know their God. They will be strong, and they will do great exploits, according to Daniel 11.32. So even right now, Father, in the various places of ministry on this campus, awaken hearts, we pray. Awaken our hearts, Lord. Help us to exemplify for our children to see what we desire for them to possess as they watch that fire within us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Consistently submitting to God's desires. How many of you believe your life will be completely changed if you learn to consistently submit to what God desires for you? Everything begins to change. It's not just about having the name of Jesus on our lips. It's about having the nature of Jesus in our heart. And as we learn to consistently submit to God's desires, um, something profound begins to be transformed within us. So, 
the two practices which we mentioned a bit ago for consistently submitting. That's the core value, consistently submitting. The two practices are solitude and community. And it's a real interesting pairing of the two. And I want to kind of walk you through that as we begin to look into Scripture uh, together. But solitude is being alone with God. I, I know uh, that sounds like a no-brainer. But you and I live in a day and a time where it is completely possible to banish solitude altogether from your world. You don't ever have to be alone. Because even when you're alone, you're interacting. Solitude is putting your phone in timeout. <laughs> Solitude is shutting down every source of input into your life so that you are truly alone with God. And, and again, it just sounds so, you know, like, sure, that makes sense. No, I, I don't. It's easy to understand it. Knowing what you ought to do and doing what you know to do are not the same things. How many of you figured that out? Uh, okay, yeah, I get it. Be alone with God. No, really, do you do this? Do you find a place of solitude? Because it pairs with community beautifully if you learn uh, how to do this. And Jesus modeled this phenomenally well. If I'm constantly in the presence of noise, constantly in the presence of input, constantly in the presence of people, then I'm always overstimulated, and I'll just remain spiritually underdeveloped. So we need to get it and understand solitude awakens a non-anxious disposition that will exist within me so that I might love others well. Solitude awakens this non-anxious disposition. I, I learned to be at rest. How many of you have your jar of dirty water at home? I posted a picture of this the other day and, and got some funny comments online from people who don't go to our church. They were shocked uh, of what I was doing when they were trying to figure out what this was. Uh, but here's your, your body is made of dirt. And we want to be at peace and at rest. This is what's crazy. The sandals of peace are a part of the um, armor of God. And so you just need to recognize and we'll grow in this understanding this year. But being at peace is resting in war. He is fighting. The Lord will fight for you. All you need to do is be still. Have you ever read that before? Be still and know that I am God. Clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Your body at rest and you learn to walk as a non-anxious presence, not stirring up everybody all the time because you're freaked out and you're not at, you're not at rest. Learning to, to live in this place that Jesus constantly was living and not allow it just to stir you up when circumstances start coming your way because it will happen and then you've got to find that place of solitude again and we'll let that settle and it'll all get clear again you have to constantly come back to this over and over to be a non-anxious presence in your world if preaching were enough you would have done it already how many of you heard a few sermons in your life be anxious for nothing. Have you read that before in, in Philippians? Be anxious for nothing. Praise God. All right, I heard that sermon. I'm never going to be anxious again. That's not the way it works. The reality is we're commanded and told in principle to be anxious for nothing, but there are practices that actually reduce our stress and take us to a place of learning what it is to become a non-anxious presence. And the practice is what unlocks a deeper reality of eternity to exist within us, and we then begin to carry that to the world around us. So solitude is very important, and it pairs with community. Community is a deep connection with God and a deep connection with others, awakening something powerful within you that you cannot experience alone. It's very important that we be alone with God, but your journey is not to be all by yourself. One generation cannot effectively disciple itself. And one individual cannot become an effective disciple alone because we were created in the image of Trinity, community, God. We're created in the image of community. So we have to have community and solitude and community come together in a beautiful way. The idea of pairing these together uh, is a little like breathing in solitude, breathing out community. Step away, breathe in, breathe out. And when you get this beautiful rhythm, you actually understand just how life-giving 
it can become. Jesus modeled a healthy balance for us to put into practice for ourselves. So, um, it's really important when we're talking these types of practices that everybody hear me say this pretty routinely. This looks different in every person's life. Solitude looks different for the person in college pursuing a degree, about to get married, just bought a house. Solitude looks different for that person versus... Um, I want to be gentle. Some, I'll just, someone whose children are, are in college and, and I don't have the demands of, of little kids and, and don't have the demands of grandchildren yet. I mean, my world and solitude looks very different. You understand? So whatever your world is, single mom, it's going to look very different for you. Don't dismiss it. Just redefine it so that it fits whatever your stage and season of life is. All of us need to be very, very careful. We're not dismissing it because of our circumstances because this is a practice Jesus modeled and it's vitally important for us to get it if we're really going to become everything he's called us to become. There is a strong relationship in the life of Jesus between his devotion to solitude and his connection to power. And this is what we're going to look at in Luke chapter 4. There is, say it again, there is a strong relationship in the life of Jesus between his devotion to solitude and his connection to power. Have you noticed that the disciples came to Jesus and they said, Jesus, teach us. Have you heard this before? Teach us what? Like, you walked on water. That was so cool. Teach us to walk on water. Like, you took that kid's lunch and you fed 5,000 people. Teach us to do that. Teach us to multiply our lunches. The, the, the blind dude, like, you spit in the guy's mouth. How cool is that? Like some stuff happened. This really happened in the Bible. And so you understand, like they weren't saying any of those things. Like teach us the cool stuff you do. <laughs> Y'all are wondering, did he really spit in the mouth? He really did. You'll have to find that in Scripture. Um, but, you know, teach us this cool stuff to do. That's not why they said. They said, teach us to pray. And the reason they didn't ask for him to teach them all the cool stuff it's because they saw the connection between his place of prayer and the power that he would demonstrate when he came out of those places of solitude with the Father in perfect communion with the Father. The circumstances no longer took control of his life. He actually was paying attention to and responding to what the Father was doing in that moment in time. He said, I only do what I see the Father doing. So turn with me, Luke chapter 4. And we'll see this bouncing back and forth parallel constantly. And Lord, would you just bless the reading of your word? And just standing here preaching today, I want to confess before my brothers and sisters and before you that I know preaching is foolishness. And the only thing that really matters is the wisdom of God awakening our hearts. I thank you that you used the foolishness of preaching to launch the New Testament church in the book of Acts. So for some reason, you've purposed that we would gather around your word, that there would be a primary voice that would begin to be heard, and an impartation from heaven would be awakened within us. But we acknowledge 1 John clearly says you don't need a man to teach you, for the anointing will teach you. And if we're not paying attention to what you are revealing when we're gathering like this, then we're missing the point altogether. So stir something within our hearts, Lord, even in the reading of your word. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Luke chapter 4, verse 1. Jesus, full, uh, this is the Amplified Bible, by the way. Man, this is crazy. I love the way it says it. I've been thinking about it all week, kept rehearsing it all week. Now Jesus, full of and in perfect communication with the Holy Spirit returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. The wilderness is a really interesting place when you study it out in Scripture. But Jesus, full of and in perfect communication with the Holy Spirit. I want to encourage you today that we might pursue, explore, desire, chase after, receive, walk in this, this idea of what it means for us to be full of and in perfect communication with the Holy Spirit. Is this possible for you? It's a reluctant 
nod my direction because what happens many times, our experiences determine our level of doctrine. And the truth is our level of doctrine needs to determine our experience. I want to say to you, 1 John chapter 2, verse 6 says, anyone who claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. N Jesus never modeled anything that you would not be able to fulfill and walk in yourself. Not just open the doorway for you to be able to, but then he commands you to pursue those practices that you see in the life of Christ. And you then too can begin to explore. It, it may not be like a long period of time as you start into this journey, but there's going to be this space of time in your life Will you just mix your faith with what's being spoken right now? There's going to be a space of time and you're going to realize I am standing right now in a moment of being full of and in perfect communication with the Holy Spirit. And as you practice those moments, then you're going to find yourself saying, I have been for the past hour full of and in perfect communication with the Holy Spirit. And after you practice that and you grow in that and you mature in that and you die enough to explore and experience this more, then it's going to be, I have for the past several hours and I have for the past day. I have been for three days. I have been for a week. I have been for the past month. I have experienced the year. Do you understand? This is God's plan for your life. That we might be full of and in perfect communication with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, help us to understand this right now. Give us just a deeper understanding. God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. Lord, would you Teach us what this looks like in our everyday lives in Jesus' mighty name. I just want to read it again. Now, Jesus, full of and in perfect communication with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And then we go on to the next chapter, chapter 5. In verse 15, <laughs> he comes out of the wilderness, by the way, a place of solitude, experiences phenomenal power, and now all of a sudden he's widely known. Verse 15, but the news about Jesus was spreading farther and large crowds kept gathering to hear him and to be healed of their illnesses. Like big groups of people started coming. Again, I'm, I'm reading all out of Amplified. You'll get different translations uh, that you're reading, but you, it'll say the same. In fact, the Amplified Bible actually takes the original text and expands around it for a greater degree of accuracy than other um, translations of Scripture. When I've shown that model, the chart before, uh, the Amplified Bible is second only to the interlinear where you're looking at the original language. So Amplified Bible, uh, I'm, I'm in love. Um, I'll, I'll try not to be too biased with you on it. But news was you know, spreading everywhere. People were being healed. They were all gathering. Like everyone is screaming for Jesus' attention. Everyone is screaming, where is this guy? I need to find this guy. Everyone is screaming for his attention. And what does Jesus do? It's the crowd time. It's, the, it's like everybody needs me. If, if, if now is the time, you know, if I've ever felt needed, now is the time I feel so needed. Everyone's screaming for his attention, verse 15. And then verse 16, what's the next verse say? But Jesus himself would often slip away to the wilderness and pray in seclusion. Everyone is needing me. I better get alone with God. Yeah, yeah. Everybody's putting a demand on me. I better put my mask on first before I start trying to take care of other people. That way I have something to give when I'm giving something out. There's nothing more frustrating than a half full Christian trying to overflow. You've got to find a place of solitude so you can be filled up with the power so you can step into a place of community and carry something of the authority of God in your life. Just listen to the quiet for a moment. The Father will not compete with your busy, noisy life. He's patiently waiting in the quiet for your attention. 
and you can stay busy, and you will miss out. Because solitude is such an important practice for you to learn as a believer. It's where you plug in to that which God is desiring for you to experience because your experience then determines your expression. And if you do not have the experience he desires for you to possess as an experience, you will never have the expression he desires for you to have as an expression. There ought to be a perspective where you are walking where you are walking with a certain measure of discernment in perfect communication with the Holy Spirit so that circumstances, situations, atmospheres, rooms, uh, demonic forces, all these spiritual forces of wickedness that the Bible talks about, they begin to shift because you show up in an attitude of authority because you're listening to what the Holy Spirit is desiring to reveal within you and within that moment. You're the sons and daughters of God. Like, your dad is the king of all kings, that heavenly father, God. That, I mean, that's just crazy. Okay, turn to Mark chapter 1. We'll just see it again, this relationship between solitude and community that Jesus demonstrates. Mark chapter 1, verse 28. Immediately, the news about him spread everywhere throughout the district surrounding Galilee. Like, everybody knew who he was. Then we read on past verse 28 to verse 35. Early in the morning, what did Jesus do? Everybody's looking for him. Early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up and he left the house. He went out to a secluded place and was praying there. Verse 36, Simon Peter and his companions, uh, companions searched everywhere, looking anxiously. I just think it's interesting that's put in there looking ain't like all these people need you where are you why aren't you answering your cell phone right now it's because i'm on do not disturb i'm alone with god i'm sorry you couldn't get me when you needed to get me but there are things i have to realize that matter even more in my life than just being available to everybody's desire Whenever everybody around me wants. Some of y'all need to hear me say, you have permission to take care of yourself. Simon Peter and his companions searched everywhere looking anxiously for him, and they found him and said, everybody is looking for you. Go ahead, uh, the worship team, if y'all will come, because I'm going to land this. And I'm not, not great at smooth transition. <laughs> My wife tells me, you know how to ruin the moment. <laughs> that may be TMI. <laughs> Especially in a day of social media. Especially in a day of social media. Fear of missing out. FOMO. It's a real thing. Turn your phone off. Spend time in prayer. What if somebody's liking an image I posted? What if somebody's trying to message me? What? I, I like so-and-so's, and I don't normally like that. I just wonder if they're going to respond. I put a comment on there. FOMO starts to just get in your head like you are not a, you are not a non-anxious presence when you're living your life in the pursuit of recognition from strangers. And I want you to think in, in that context as I say this, the more we steadily interact with strangers, which happens a lot, the more we steadily interact with strangers, the more we present ourselves rather than being authentically known. And if you spend your life presenting yourself without ever developing genuine relationships where you are authentically known, you'll become something God never intended for you to become. Because you are supposed to be a person that is authentically known in relationship with those who are true community <laughs> They know some secrets about you. There ought to be at least three people who could, you know, like if they talked, you'd be in trouble. <laughs> You've got to bear your soul. 
You can be with people and not actually be in community if you never move beyond surface level interaction. Where are you getting heart to heart? Who are you? Who, can, can we just make this clear? How many of you have a struggle in your life that you would like to see God just deal with right now? Just raise your hand. You have a struggle in your life. Just hold them up there real high. I mean, let's be honest as a church. This is the thing that you've got to understand. God doesn't just come to us and extract the struggle. He actually gives us the process of what it looks like to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And the Bible says, pray for each other, confess your faults or your struggles to each other, and you'll be healed. Community is a part of your wellness. It's really important that we understand it. And bearing that in mind, I read an article once, and it gave the, you've heard me talk about this in the table, uh, you know, that season. But I read the three things people love to hear more than any, like all nations of the world. This is, this is the case around the world. Three things people love to hear more than anything else. Number one, I love you. We all want to feel loved because we're designed by God who is love to need to be loved. I love you. Number two, the second most favorite phrase people love to hear, you're forgiven. Kind of goes back to love, doesn't it? Like we're back in right relationship now. We're reconciled. I love you. You're forgiven. Number three, let's eat. It's a beautiful reality. It also comes back to love. Because that's where we find a deeper sense of communion and fellowship and friendship and family when we get around the table together. In fact, this is a beautiful picture of ministry. For God so loved the world, I love you, that he sent his son to die on a cross. You're forgiven. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the heart, the door of his heart, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. Revelation chapter 3. Let's eat. You want to know what effective ministry is into the lives of those around you? I love you. You're forgiven. Let's eat. I'm just overwhelmed at this reality of how simple it is to care for the needs of people around us just because we've been drawn into this place of friendship with God. It just doesn't take that much. But it begins by you understanding God sent his son Jesus to forgive you of your sin and you need forgiveness of your sin like Adam and Eve sinned and it brought this generational sin that progresses along down through the generations Jesus came to disrupt that and break that that's why he had to die a painful beaten bloody bruised death so have you confessed your sin before God? I, I actually came up here and walked laps in this room yesterday just praying. And I was praying over you all and praying over this moment. And I felt the Lord prompt me to tell you what I'm about to say. The attitude of supremacy wars against salvation because our goodness seems to qualify us. If we can be good enough, we feel better about ourselves before the Lord. Somebody in this room has been better than the rest of us this week, and you get the best good person award of the week. And what that does is awakens a sense of supremacy and arrogance in your life that would cause you to think erroneously you do not need the cross of Jesus Christ. The other side of that, and this one really got me, it's the basis of humility. And if you're here today, and you're looking at the cross of Christ and you say, man, I've just done too much. You don't know my past. You know how bad I've been. What you're saying, looking at the cross, is Jesus, your death is not enough. And that's a lie. Come on, would you just open your heart with me today? God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. So Lord, uh, we want to move away from any attitude of arrogance that would cause us to feel like we don't need you. 
We want to move away from an attitude of self-disqualification as if the blood of Jesus Christ, God himself who died a sin, lived a sinless life and died, as if that wouldn't be enough. It's more than enough. We acknowledge, Lord, we need you. Thank you, Lord, you came, you lived, and you died. You're risen from the grave. You're the Savior of the world. In our state of, t- of sin, you are our only hope. And so today we just affirm and acknowledge we believe you are who you say you are. We need you as our Lord and Savior. If you've made that decision before or you're making it right now, would you say out loud, boldly, amen. <laughs> We just acknowledge, Lord, you are who you are. In Jesus' mighty name. Come on, that's kind of the essence of um, solitude, a moment for you. But now let me just talk with you for a moment about a moment of community. Because on February the 18th, we're going to do something called Next Steps Sunday. It's just to introduce you to Discover Destiny Community Group. Less than an hour, right after service, we're going to have this conversation, probably about 30 minutes, and explain what it means for us to come together in community as the body of Christ. If you've been attending church here for a while, you're really not involved, not serving, not in a connect group or community group, then you really should sign up for this and and let's walk that out together. This is the desire of God. He loves the church and wants us to grow together as a family. And if you are first time with us or you've not gone through this before, then just scan that code and get signed up and we'll follow up to give you the details and it'll be a really refreshing time of just growing in an understanding of who we are as a church family and what God's doing in you that actually helps us become more of who he's called us to become. Come on, let's stand together. In the expression of our need for community, I want to ask you to do something unique. Do we have communion set up up here as well? Is that right? I can't see the dark there. Communion over here, communion over here. Okay, good. And communion in the back. We're prepared for everybody to receive communion. We have communion every week right here in the back of the center here so that during worship you'd like to go receive communion, go to the giving station. We want that to be a worshipful experience for you. His sacrifice, our sacrifice. But on days like today, we want to have communion all together. Before we start launching into pizza, we'll give you some details on that. I'm sorry, Italian cuisine, Domino's. Um, What we want to do is we want to receive communion. And uh, I want to ask you to do something a little different today so I want you to make your way and get your elements of communion and then listen this is important I want you to take your elements once you get them and I want you if somebody else has those elements they're going to be receiving communion as well just exchange them it's like an exchange of the nature of Christ in our love for each other okay so don't don't just take from the cup you're going to get but exchange it and then come back to your seat and we'll receive all together
talking about is the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. I want to do this just in a meaningful way. Thank you. I want to do this in, in a, a meaningful way. Have you exchanged your elements with someone? What we're saying is we experience the nature of Christ. We exchange the nature of Christ. We want people to experience the nature of Christ. When we partake of Him, we actually then are equipped to give something that we wouldn't have otherwise to give. And so typically what happens, um, I just want to lean into an experience that I had with a, a team that we work with in England, and they, uh, we sat one day and we, we took a, a big loaf of bread and we passed it around. Everybody broke off a large piece of bread. And then we had a, a cup of, of juice. It was a large cup of juice. So we had a big piece of bread and a big cup of juice, and we sat for a couple of hours, and we just read Scripture. And communion was so impactful to me because as we were reading Scripture, when the Scripture would speak to me, I would just eat some of the bread, and I would drink some of the juice and just thank God that I was spiritually alive enough to digest something coming from God's Word. And the Bible says, be careful, don't take communion in a manner that's unworthy. And so I want you just to examine your heart for a moment, and then I'm just going to begin to read some Scripture. And as I'm reading that Scripture, as you're partaking of the nature of Christ and the way you're even taking in His Word, we should be experiencing something deeper with God. Just ponder for a moment where you are in your relationship with Christ. And if you sealed the deal just moments ago as we were praying, it's beautiful, it's wonderful. But one more time, just if that's not where you are and you want to be there with Him, not where your goodness is what you're relying on, and not where your badness has kept you out, but where his righteousness is all that really matters. Uh, Steve Sibley told me right before service, he was reading a verse in the Passion in the book of Psalms that says, and God has hidden you in his holiness. Oh, Lord, thank you. So come on, would you just yield your heart to him? Thank you, Lord just for the meaningful reality of what is taking place when we gather like this and we share in your word and share in worship and share in communion and as we step into uh, beyond this to a true meal together as a family take us deeper Lord we pray thank you that it's the broken body of Jesus and the shed blood of Christ that gives us entrance to be able to exchange with God even as we read the word. It's not just reading the book. It is encountering the author. It's because of the cross of Jesus Christ. So take and eat and drink as you'd like as I'm reading and saying, now Jesus, full of and in perfect communication with the Holy Spirit, Jesus, full of and in perfect communication with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. 1 John 2, 6, anyone who claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. 2 Corinthians 13, 14, may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Thank you, Lord. Your broken body, your shed blood changes our experience and the way we encounter God. In Jesus' mighty name. Take it. If you've not taken communion, go ahead.
going to ask if our prayer team will go ahead and come. We're just going to take a few moments just to bring back anything God has awakened within us, anything God has deposited within us. It's just been rich this morning. <laughs> rich sense of His presence. We'll give you some instruction for our lunch together just immediately following this, but can we just bring anything God has awakened within us? Let's bring it back to Him in a posture of worship. And if we can pray with you in agreement about anything at all that's going on in your life or somebody around you, then our prayer team's available as we take these few moments and just press in to go a little deeper with Him.